Hello everyone, welcome to the Tim Booker channel. Wishing you an enjoyable listening experience. Today, the book I'll be interpreting for you is titled Counterclockwise. This book revolves around health, illness, and aging, intricately linked to our lives. None of us wish to age quickly, we desire health and to steer clear of ailments. Yet, it's undeniable that every individual is on the path of aging. For many, aging seems daunting because it signifies decline in various aspects. Physically, there's declining eyesight, reduced agility, cognitively, intelligence, memory, and responsiveness diminish, often leading to what's colloquially termed as being forgetful. But is this truly the case? Evidence from neuroscience shows that over 90% of 60-year-olds have brain activity comparable to young adults in their 20s. This means that seniors, in terms of cognitive abilities like memory, reasoning, and information processing, aren't inferior to younger individuals. So why is it that aging is often associated with weakness, helplessness, and multiple ailments? Perhaps it's because we tend to view aging rigidly, assuming that with age comes inevitable decline and vulnerability. While aging does bring about many challenges, we mustn't disregard other possibilities. For instance, when faced with forgetfulness, many immediately attribute it to aging, yet it could simply be due to not investing time and energy into memory as before. As the author of this book states, aging is an indoctrinated concept, we need to perceive more possibilities. Author Ellen J. Langer, a professor in the psychology department at Harvard University and a pioneer in positive psychology, has dedicated over 50 years to this field. She has conducted groundbreaking experiments challenging conventional beliefs about the mind-body relationship, earning numerous accolades. This book incorporates several experiments by Professor Langer, and the following interpretations will revolve around these experiments. Professor Langer's psychological perspectives diverge from mainstream psychology in some aspects. Typically, psychology tends to describe general facts, for instance, stating that as time passes, people's eyesight and memory decline. If someone in old age has exceptional eyesight or memory, psychologists might consider this an exception. However, Professor Langer's interest lies precisely in these exceptions, as they offer additional possibilities for how we perceive ourselves and the world. This book aims to explore an alternative approach to health, illness, and aging, as well as methods to achieve this approach. Next, I'll divide the interpretation into two parts. Firstly, we'll examine seemingly improbable aspects about health and aging. For example, is achieving reverse aging possible? To what extent can our mental state influence our physical condition? Secondly, we'll focus on seemingly definite aspects of health on the path to reverse aging that might not be as certain as they seem. For instance, do seemingly definite diagnostic labels truly make us healthier? First, let's explore whether reversing time for reverse aging is feasible. In 1979, author Langer conducted an experiment known as the counterclockwise study. Despite its age, the experiment's relevance remains intact today. Its objective was to observe if psychologically regressing participants by 20 years would result in physical regression as well. To reverse time, Langer meticulously arranged a secluded monastery to resemble its state 20 years prior, in 1959. Sixteen individuals, around 80 years old, were recruited and divided into two groups, the experimental and control groups, spending a week at the monastery. Initially excited, upon arrival, the elderly were surprised rather than intrigued. The author instructed them to manage their luggage independently, without assistance, stating they could take fewer items at a time if needed. Initially daunting, as many hadn't managed such loads in over a decade, they eventually succeeded in moving their belongings into their rooms, albeit gradually. During the week, the participants engaged in discussions on political and social topics from 20 years earlier, listened to broadcasts and watched TV programs from that era, listened to music from that time, and read newspapers and magazines from 20 years prior. The only difference between the groups was in their mode of communication, the experimental group was required to converse in the present tense, reflecting that it was 1959, while the control group used the past tense, acknowledging the present as distinct from 1959. The results were striking. By the second day, significant changes were evident. Previously reliant on family, these individuals became active, organizing, 
cleaning, and managing their daily lives independently. Post-week, physical assessments revealed substantial improvements in hearing, vision, physical and cognitive abilities, gait, posture, memory, taste sensitivity, and dexterity. Some even began playing football. Notably, the experimental group displayed more significant changes than the control group, appearing at least two years younger when compared to photos from a week earlier. In merely a week, by believing they were 20 years younger and adopting a youthful mindset, these 16 individuals experienced remarkable physical transformations. However, a few intriguing aspects deserve further discussion. Firstly, when the elderly arrived and were tasked with handling their luggage, the author intentionally refrained from offering assistance. Despite being reasonable to expect help for individuals around 80 years old, this decision aimed to highlight how excessive protection might be prevalent among most people. Assisting others may generate a sense of well-being but can gradually strip recipients of their sense of control. Once this power is lost, one truly enters old age. Control becomes especially crucial in the elderly phase, impacting not just happiness but overall mental and physical health. In another experiment in a nursing home during the 1970s, Langer and colleagues demonstrated the significance of control among seniors. They divided residents into two groups, one had autonomy over decisions like choosing plants or arranging visitors and movie screenings, while the other followed staff directives. A year and a half later, those with autonomy were happier, more active, alert, and had a lower mortality rate than the controlled group. The intent behind these experiments isn't to discourage helping the elderly but to advocate for thoughtful assistance, granting them time and space for personal solutions. While caregiving is essential, excessive protection might deprive seniors of autonomy and control over their lives. Encouraging and respecting their opinions and choices can significantly benefit their mental and physical well-being. Secondly, did you notice that even the control group in the counterclockwise study, those who reminisced using the past tense, experienced improvements? This might seem counterintuitive as reminiscing about the past, especially in old age, might evoke a sense of aging. However, research indicates that while people of all ages reminisce, their purposes differ. Younger individuals seek self-discovery or solutions, whereas older individuals focus more on sharing experiences and maintaining relationships, emphasizing positive aspects and experiences, resulting in positive emotional outcomes rather than melancholy or loss. Moreover, according to psychologist Eric Erickson's stages of psychosocial development, the elderly enter a phase of self-integration. Nostalgia provides an opportunity to review one's life, accept oneself, and gain wisdom, serving as a tool for self-acceptance and personal growth. As My White-Haired Life eloquently summarizes, nostalgia in old age isn't just about reminiscing but seeking motivation from the past, inspiring a better present and a more promising future. As family members, when our parents repeatedly recall past events, perhaps more listening and understanding, less impatience, can allow us to relive those beautiful moments with them, witnessing the miracle of reverse aging. Lastly, in the counterclockwise study, it's evident that not only the regained sense of control and positive effects of reminiscence contributed to the elderly, reverse aging, but the influence of surroundings and people played a pivotal role. The usage of present tense communication and not deliberately altering anything to cater to elderly preferences provided psychological cues of youth. In our lives, unnoticed cues constantly influence our mental and physical health. These cues, whether positive or negative, act as switches controlling our behaviors. In a priming experiment, Langer and students randomly sorted 100 photos based on different criteria. Participants in the experimental group categorized photos according to their preferences, disregarding age-related associations, while the control group was instructed to categorize based solely on age. Upon leaving the lab, the control group, primed with the elderly concept, took longer strides, exhibiting heavier movements resembling actual elderly individuals. Conversely, positive priming cues generate vastly different outcomes. In another experiment with hotel maids, one group was informed that their routine work constituted enough exercise to meet health standards, while the other group received no such information. For weeks later, those informed about their exercise levels experienced weight loss, reduced body fat, and lower blood pressure without any additional exercise outside their routine work. Certainly, dedicated time for activities like jogging or exercising is optimal for maintaining health. 
However, for individuals lacking time or ability, like office workers or elderly individuals with mobility constraints, reframing routine activities as exercise can bring about health improvements. Exercise isn't confined to specific activities but can occur anytime, like fetching water or grocery shopping. Encouraging positive cues for ourselves or our elderly relatives might partially enhance health conditions. Summarizing the details of the counterclockwise study, the results suggest that reversing time for reverse aging is possible. Yet, it's not as straightforward as emulating past lifestyles for identical outcomes. Attempting changes presents the possibility of improvement. Stubbornly presuming aging equates to inevitable decline might trap us in rigid thinking, blinding us to the potential for change. Aging doesn't inherently signify decline or lack of control and improvement possibilities. Often, our limitations stem from our perceptions, not our bodies. Breaking the stereotypes of age and aging, adjusting our mentality, embracing positive cues, and gaining more control can lead to improvements, triggering a reverse aging effect. Okay, after discussing the possibility of turning back time and achieving reverse aging, let's talk about what seems certain regarding health on the path of reverse aging, which isn't actually as certain as it appears. We tend to prefer certainty because it gives us a sense of security. However, through years of research, the author realized that pursuing certainty is actually a dreadful mindset. When everything is certain, we fail to see the possibilities in the world. Therefore, the author suggests not fearing uncertainty, especially concerning our health. Uncertainty has many benefits, it creates more opportunities for choices and helps us better control our lives. It might sound strange because, for a long time, we've sought definite answers when it comes to health. For instance, when we fall ill, don't we all urgently want to know what's wrong? Whether we search online or visit a specialist, we're seeking authoritative information about our symptoms, hoping the doctor's diagnosis becomes our health prescription. On the surface, this seems fine, and most people follow this pattern. However, here's the catch. When we worry about our health and seek medical advice, there's a tendency to focus more on the form rather than the content. What does that mean? Let's start with a little story. Once, the author and her students stood in line to use a copy machine and wanted to cut in line. They made three requests, can I use the copy machine first? Can I use the copy machine first because I need to make copies? Can I use the copy machine first because I'm in a hurry? As expected, using the second and third ways of asking increased the likelihood of being allowed to cut in. Interestingly, the second request, can I use the copy machine first because I need to make copies, had an invalid reason because everyone in line needed to make copies. But why did almost no one question it? The author believes it's because of the inclusion of a crucial word in the sentence, because. In other words, providing a reason, regardless of how absurd, tends to prompt people to agree without much thought. Similarly, in seeking medical help, once a doctor makes a diagnosis, patients tend to obediently follow the prescription. We often fail to consciously engage in understanding the basis of the diagnosis, whether it truly fits our actual condition. In other words, we don't actively participate in the decision-making of the diagnosis, almost as if it doesn't concern us. However, the author reminds us that diagnostic tools are imperfect and not completely accurate. Perhaps these tools can successfully predict most people's conditions, but individual differences always exist in reality. Therefore, summarizing a person's identity, situation, experience, or potential with a deterministic diagnostic label is highly misleading. It misleads not only ourselves but also professional doctors. Diagnostic labels easily lead people on a path of assumption confirmation, compelling them to search for evidence supporting the diagnostic label. For instance, after being diagnosed with depression, many people tend to attribute common occurrences in life to depression. Poor appetite becomes depression, insomnia becomes depression, bad mood becomes depression. In reality, the accuracy rate of diagnosing depression is not very high, probably only around 50%. Hence, you might not actually have depression but rather simple emotional issues. This tendency is present in both laypersons and doctors. When working at Yale University, the author and another psychologist conducted a study. They created a video showing a person in a job interview. 
They showed half of the clinical therapists the video labeling the person as a patient and the other half labeling the person as a job applicant. Surprisingly, when labeled as a job applicant, all clinical therapists perceived the person positively without any issues. However, when labeled as a patient, the opinions among these clinical therapists varied. Some believed the person was performing poorly and needed treatment, while others thought the person performed well and didn't require treatment. This leads us to ponder, while diagnosis is meant to assist in our health, confirming and providing us with a sense of control over our health conditions, does it genuinely make us healthier? Perhaps we should re-examine diagnostic labels and the power of medical terminology. For instance, many individuals who wish to have children but cannot conceive are labeled as infertile. Indeed, some people might genuinely be infertile, but not everyone. Once labeled infertile, people often perceive it as an unchangeable fact, becoming extremely disappointed and stressed. Stress itself is a factor in infertility, and this continued stress can deteriorate marital relationships. If the relationship worsens, the chances of pregnancy further decrease. Consequently, the diagnosis of infertility becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Take cancer, for example. If someone had cancer, then later it disappears, does that mean it's remission or cure? Although both terms indicate stability in various aspects of health, the nuanced expression might significantly affect an individual's health perception. The author recruited 64 participants in the New England region, all of whom had breast cancer and were currently stable. However, their perspectives on this state differed. Some considered it remission, while others thought it was a cure. Therefore, the author divided them into two groups, the remission group and the cure group. They completed several health questionnaires, and the results showed that compared to the remission group, the cure group had significantly higher overall health levels, better physical function, felt more energetic, experienced less fatigue and pain, and had stronger psychological well-being. Yes, the author prompts us to reconsider diagnostic labels and the power of medical terminology. While labels aid in organizing our thoughts, when these labels dictate our thought processes, issues arise. Whether it's a doctor's diagnosis or the labels we assign ourselves, unquestionably accepting them as definitive and unchanging is ultimately unhelpful for our health. So, how should we approach illness? The author believes that the most crucial aspect is to maintain mindfulness. In simple terms, it means consciously and moderately paying attention to changes in our bodies. Just like we mentioned earlier, focus on the uncertainty of health. Rather than viewing a diagnosis as an answer or an explanation, regard it as a starting point to ask further questions. Maintain mindfulness, observe changes, and don't become a prisoner of the illness. For instance, we can maintain awareness of our physical condition by writing in a journal. Note down the changes experienced every few hours, along with the surrounding environmental conditions. Research has shown that maintaining mindful writing can alleviate stress, strengthen the immune system, reduce blood pressure, enhance psychological well-being, and improve health in multiple ways. For example, if someone experiences chronic pain, maintaining mindfulness about the symptoms of chronic pain might be helpful. How long does pain occur in a particular area? Is it every other day? Several times a day? How long does each episode of pain last? To what extent is the pain experienced? Are there periods when there's no pain at all? What activities are occurring during those pain-free periods? Documenting these details helps gain comprehensive insight into one's symptoms. This might reveal that pain isn't constant, showing patterns during certain environmental or time circumstances. This provides directions for controlling and improving physical health. Following this line of thought prompts more questions, and with different questions come different answers. Of course, besides maintaining mindfulness for ourselves, we can also assist family and friends in staying mindful, observing subtle changes in their bodies. This can bring them positive experiences, making them feel cared for and valued, contributing to their overall physical and mental health. Once, a doctor said, we doctors need your help to think better. We need you to question us, point out when we're doing well, and when we're straying, being a doctor is genuinely challenging, but being a patient is even more challenging. Indeed, medicine itself is a scientific exploration with its uncertainties, not absolute truths. 
When seeking information about a particular illness, it's crucial to consult a doctor who undoubtedly knows more than us. However, when it comes to the uniqueness of each person's condition, only the patient truly understands their own sensations and thoughts. Therefore, what we should do is combine the doctor's perspective with our understanding of ourselves. Instead of passively waiting for the doctor to ask what they consider important and helpful for the diagnosis, we should actively contribute vital information related to our sensations and experiences. We should actively engage in our health decisions. All right, that's all this book, Counterclockwise, introduces. In the first part, through the author's retroactive study, we witness the possibility of reverse aging. It tells us that aging doesn't necessarily mean decline. Often, what limits us isn't our bodies themselves but our perceptions of them. While we might not truly turn back time, stopping the march of aging, we can still choose to age in a young way. This could involve adjusting our perception of physical limits and reconsidering the stereotypes of aging, providing ourselves with positive psychological suggestions to control decline and improve health. In the second part, we discuss how the pursuit of certainty is, in reality, a frightening mindset. When everything is certain, we fail to see the possibilities in the world. Therefore, the author advises us not to fear uncertainty, especially concerning our health. By perceiving medical diagnosis information as guidance rather than absolute truth and acknowledging that things are fluid, we can see possibilities for disease improvement and health enhancement. Just like the review of Counterclockwise by psychological counselor Lee Song Wei, who said, this book discusses how psychological states can promote physical health. Its greatest value lies in disrupting the cognitive process about health. It reveals the fact that an overly medicalized diagnostic language constructs health as a rigid, linear, and unquestionable cognitive system, originally meant to promote health but ultimately leading to the opposite. Breaking away from this cognition and returning to a world full of uncertainty and possibilities can bring a different hope for health. All right. That's all the content I've presented to you. Congratulations, you've completed another book. Thank you all for your support and attention. Please subscribe to the Tim Booker channel, like, and share this valuable knowledge with your friends. Let's combine wisdom and practice, achieve our financial goals, and create a better future together. Thank you, goodbye.